Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm super pumped to be joined by Bill Dedimore, the head hog of Pork Pie Percussion. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So you yourself, it's like we're here to talk about pork pie, but we're also just talking about you in general because you've got quite the background. So let's maybe expand it about Bill Dedimore kind of as a person and then get into pork pie because you have backgrounds with DW. You've painted many famous drummers drums. You, you're you just kind of a, mm-hmm. a, a really like a, a, a rock in the industry who's kind of always doing cool things, but uh, has a very level head. So Bill, all that being said, why don't you, um, I mean, you can go back to your beginning with drums and what got you into it, and then just take us through the whole story with what led to pork pie, and then we'll get into pork pie. Sure, sure. So um, when I was uh, probably 15, give or take, <clears throat> I told my folks that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to learn how to uh, play drums. And they said, uh, you know, you've been in and out of hobbies and it's, it's cost us a fortune. So if you want to do it, you have to figure it out. So we're not going to, we're not going to put money out. You, you have to figure it out, which, um, my parents were children of the depression. So having to figure it out was nothing new for myself or my brothers. I mean, it was nothing new, any, any bicycles you know I used to race BMX and motorcycles and I had to I had to fix everything I had to I we had we had to do everything on our own um and and that was just out of their um their upbringing I mean people that lived through the depression and what three four wars you know you have a different uh perspective on uh what's important and what's not important yeah and um so what happened was uh i was uh, riding my stingray through through the neighborhood and there was this guy in the neighborhood his name was tony that's uh, as much as i remember about him and i remember i distinctly remember riding by his house and hearing drums come out out of his uh, garage and since i knew him i went up and i went inside and uh he had this giant drum set just i mean there were toms everywhere and you know and i i said uh, because you know we came from the same neighborhood the same age and i knew he was broke like like (laughs) me you know 15 years old and i said how did you afford this giant drum set and he said oh it's really simple he said you go to music stores because at the time there were you know music and drum stores everywhere and he said i find pieces so none of the pieces matched but none of the kit matched and he showed me you know he took a drum and turned it over and he said all these screws take off all the all the parts the lugs and he said there's a uh uh uh, plastics place a plastics store like uh they sold uh, acrylic and vinyl and stuff like that and they had pvc vinyl thin pvc vinyl and he said, what you do is you go to Gemolite Plastics uh, in, in the same town in Woodland Hills and you uh, you cut the piece to size and you wrap it around and figure out how to seal the, you know, put it together. I ended up using crazy glue because I had no idea what else to do. Sure. And he said, you poke a hole and put the lugs back on and all of a sudden you have a drum set that is uh, all matching. Wow. So the first drums that I had that I had in my bedroom I borrowed two pieces, uh, a tom and a bass drum. It was probably a 20 inch bass drum and probably a 12 inch tom and a hi-hat stand. And the hi-hat cymbals were so thin that if you press down with your foot too much, they would (laughs) invert, you know, they would fold out. Yeah. So I remember the first, uh, and you know, I, I had no hardware. So I had a chair in my room and i got some uh, wire that my father had and i figured out how to turn the chair backwards and then use the wire around the tension rods to hold the tom up <laughs> over the bass drum <laughs> then after i played that for a while and and got hi-hats that wouldn't invert when you stepped on them too hard <clears throat> then i started buying individual drums and then changing the finish on them 
And that's how I ended up with my first uh, drum set. You know, I feel like drummers it, it uh, and musicians in general who start as a kid can really trace back what they do for the rest of their life as a kid. I mean, you're 15 years old and that's really set you up for what you've done for the rest of your life, which is pretty cool. I mean, not well, everyone has that. It's very neat. Yeah. And you know what? My mother, uh, bless her heart, she used to she used to say she told me this so many times. She said, um, she says, I have no idea what it is about those drums, but the minute that you started playing them, that's all you did all the time. That's all yeah. I did. And so that led into, you know, when I, um, after I played that one kit for a while, I remember I went out and bought at, uh, Mel Zelnick's music stop, which is just down the street from my shop here, uh, in Canoga park. Um, it was a, uh, a really, it was a great drum store. You know, he used to have, uh, like Wednesday nights or Thursday nights, he would have, uh, open drum night and he would have everybody come in and you would go in and, and you would trade fours and, you know, then he would play, he was an old jazz drummer. Cool. And, um, he was just, you know, the, the guy who, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was there for the art and some of the guys that would come into that, uh, to hang out with us was Mark Schulman was, uh, one of the guys cause he grew up in this area and Bruce Becker. Mm -hmm. And then they would bring Bruce, Bruce Becker in with his brother, David, and they would do a little, little jazz combo and they would, you know, play some, some jazz for us. And everybody would have a turn playing, you know, playing and trading fours. And, you know, you, you learn real fast uh, when you're sitting down with somebody that's a lot more professional with you. You learn really fast what trading fours means. Don't yeah. play over me. <laughs> Count four bars and then stop. Okay. Just yeah. stop. And then I'll do four bars and you come back. So, uh, so we used to do that. My, my friends and I would do that uh, quite often. Then at that time, this would have been 1977, probably way before anything digital, you know, I mean, way, way, way before anything digital. Um, there was a local LA newspaper that was called the Penny Saver and they had uh, uh, sections and one of them was uh, drums or guitars or musical instruments. And you could find people were, that were selling things. So I would go and buy things, buy, buy snare drums, and uh, I would buy them and bring them home and tear them apart and rebuild them and clean them and then mm -hmm. resell them. So it Smart. was, it was a, a nice, fun uh, little hobby. Well, I mean, drums have, I would say, versus like a synthesizer, there's kind of a lower barrier of entry to taking it apart to some degree. Obviously, mm -hmm. you've mastered it and no, there's sonically there's more to it. But really, the the bare bones like structure of it is lugs, wood, hoops, a skin. You can get a drum going. So right. for a kid, it's pretty it's pretty like attainable. And then from there, you can go nuts and spend your whole life doing it. But, um, you know, you were a kind of a, you were a smart little little guy to be getting this all going and uh, and, and, and working. I mean, you worked hard at it, obviously. Well, you know, when I, when I, to earn the money to get, uh, get all those first pieces that I had, um, I mean, I was mowing lawns, you know, I, I would go up and mow the lawns on every, every house on our block. And that's how I made, made money. I spent my entire Saturday mowing lawns so I could get money to go out and buy drum stuff. Funny story about my father is that, uh, when he was probably 18 ish, you know, right out of uh, or either in high school or right in high school. He spent some of his time uh, doing uh, uh, auto body repair. And I said, how did you figure that out? And he said, well, I uh, uh, applied for the job and they said, do you know how to do any of this stuff? And I, he said, well, sure I do. And then he went home and called us, you know, went to his father and said, hey, I need to know, you know, the basics of body work. And he would he'd go, oh, yeah, let me call Fred. And he called Fred and Fred would go, OK, so here's the things that you do. And he would go there and he, he worked. I mean, he worked as a body shop guy with no training. He was a jeweler with no training. I mean, he did everything that he did was, you know, wow. uh, with, with no training. He figured it out. Did he teach you anything about painting? Because I've always seen I mean, you, you're a you paint a lot in which I'm sure we'll talk about throughout this. But did you learn from your dad how to do that? 
Yeah, that's where I first uh, started. I actually uh, made a spray booth in their garage because I wasn't living at their house at the time. So I made a spray booth in their garage out of four pieces of plywood and a, and a circular fan on one side of it. But I would walk in on this, you know, through this door that I made and uh, paint. Uh, the, the first things I painted were I bought uh, some guitar bodies. I painted those. And... Um, and that did nothing but piss off the neighbors because I was using lacquer because I didn't know any anything other than lacquer at the time. And he showed me he he had the materials or the tools to uh, spray lacquer. And he he had this little gauge. I have no idea what it's what it's called, but it was like a cup, and it had a hole in the bottom. And you would fill, you would mix up your paint with uh, the paint and the reducer, and you would put it in there and you saw how fast it drained out of the bottom of it, and that's how you gauged mm. how, how thick your paint was supposed to be. So he had all that stuff at the house. So he showed me how to use that gauge and how to mix, and you know, you don't wanna do this too much, don't do this too much, can't be too thick, you get, don't put it on too, you know, he did all that. Mm. But that was, the, that yeah. was all he, he taught me. Uh, everything else uh, I taught myself. Well, I think now we live in, I mean, YouTube is awesome. You can learn so much off YouTube, but there's something, uh, n it's the next level is when you actually have hands-on teaching from someone, which I think oh, is yeah. how people really, really get I, the knowledge, uh, like from you and yeah, with your dad. Right. So what I, what I, uh, I, I see these guys on, uh, usually Facebook, uh, cause you know, you can have a more of a conversation there. And they'll say, yeah, I think I'm going to uh, buy all of these tools from drum maker or whoever, you know, I don't, I don't know people who sell the tools or a mat, how to uh, a marking mat, you know, you put it, yeah, it's a roll up mat and you roll it out and it's got all the lines. So you sure. put a drum on there and you can show where the lugs are. I mean, when I started, none of this stuff existed. I had to make it all. So I took, actually I have right here. It's a little dusty, but uh, from uh, when I was in school, when I was in college, oh yeah, huh. I studied drafting, and that's a technical drawing, correct? So yeah, yeah, I, I was a uh, technical illustrator. Wow, uh, and I also did drafting. Wow. So what I did was I uh, took a piece of cardboard and I made a circle uh, that was uh, uh, for. Let's just talk about a snare drum because it's easy. I, I made a, a circle on the uh, cardboard that was 13 and 7 eighths and then I had my center point and then I figured out by uh, uh, taking pi and dividing it by 10 how far apart all mm. the lines are and that's how I ma made my first uh, marking wow. templates and to this day to show you I am a firm believer a firm believer that the more you physically touch something you're making that that is what makes it cool yeah right i think you're right i mean that is cool i think making making something from nothing is the coolest thing you can do yes so the marking templates that we have now that we still use to this day are all made using that same principle we live in a great time now where things are accessible to you but i almost equate it to like like for me in school if i would handwrite notes I would remember things better versus typing it out or just reading it. Like if I copy th something down and write it myself, I feel like it went into my brain forever. And I think it's that of course. physically touching something. And, and that clearly yeah. just throughout your whole career, uh, you're a maker. I mean, you're a doer and a maker. And uh, and that's, I think, clear in pork pie because you signed. I'll show you later, but I have a pork pie snare from 2002 which uh, signed by you and dated on the inside and everything. Um, so getting back on the timeline of like your your life and everything. So we were in the late 70s. Uh, you were uh, still doing this for fun, right? You had right. not become like a you're not making money at it yet. No. You're still learning. So what, what happens from there? OK, so um, I start I uh, f uh, got my AA degree at Pierce College here close close to here. And um, I was working for working at Rocketdyne um on the space shuttle program um and rocketdyne used to be right up the street from here um and rocketdyne mm. is the company that made the the main engines that were on the space shuttle 
Um, so I was working there in the technical illustration department, putting together presentations. So let's say a, um, uh, a shuttle went up, then we would put a presentation together that showed how the engines worked, uh, how they, you know, how they performed, and that would go to management. And then I also did some uh, uh, some uh, uh, drafting there, and you know, a lot of different things that I did there. And what was cool about that was I. Uh, I graduated from Pierce uh, on, let's say, June 10th, and on June 11th, I had a job. So that was that was a cool thing. So uh, while I was working yeah. there, uh, always reading Modern Drummer, there was two things that were pivotal uh, for me, and that was I was just I, I loved reading the stories from uh, about Pat Foley and Paul Jameson. Paul Jameson was uh, Jeff Picaro's tech. And Pat Foley was the guy in town that was uh, buying old Radio Kings. And he was buying old Radio Kings and giving them a, a nice paint job, as nice as it could be at that time. And that's kind of what started feeding the, uh, you know, buy them and rebuild them. When I first started, I would just clean them up and I'd just resell them and hopefully I just made my money back. But then later on, it was buying uh, uh, buying snare drums and pulling them all apart and then packing the lugs and cutting the bearing edges and, you know, putting them together, change the throw off, you know, all that stuff. And then that, 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 with that, I could, I could sell them and make a little bit of profit. But I was working at Rocketdyne, so it was just something to do on the side. But in Modern Drummer... There was a company called the Quarter Drum Company. And the Quarter Drum Company, when Fives went under, the Quarter Drum Company bought all the tooling and everything from Fives and made it the Quarter Drum Company. So they had that, uh, uh, that you know, the Fives lug. I'm trying sure. to draw with my finger here. They, yes, they had the yes. Fives lug and the spurs and, you know, all that stuff. So they had an advertisement in the back of Modern Drummer that says, uh, we, that they sold a kit to make your own snare drum. So it would be the shell and it would be the lugs and a throw off and butt plate and hoops. And it might have had heads, but it was just a raw shell with no holes or anything. So I, I bought one of those. And uh, again, my father, you know, telling me how to paint, teaching me how to paint. So I would paint it. And then I would uh, cut the edges and put it together and sold that one. And then with what I made on that, then I bought two and four and six. And, you know, I, that's that's basically how the, the company hmm. started. What I love is so I've got a Fibes episode the, uh, with Tommy Robertson. There's a quarter episode with Don Quarter. And yeah. uh, and I don't think I have a Darwin episode. I'll have to do that to complete my trifecta right. of that that background. But <laughs> right. it's it's neat to know that you're involved. It's just th that had that the fives thing had such kind of a I don't know like a it's really pivotal in a lot of the history of a, a lot of drum history and brands and things. It's neat to know you're included in that. It had a, it had a very a, a long reach, a longer That's, reach than people know about. Good way to put it. Yep. So then I, I started, uh, uh, you know, uh, buying and selling snare drums with my logo on it. And uh, actually, when I was working at Rocketdyne is when I came up with the uh, with the logo in, in downtime. Uh, I did the first uh, uh, little pig guy that I had. I, uh, I, I drew that. I hand drew that. Um, and then I, I saw a uh, font. And uh, we had these big books that had all kinds of fonts in them, you know, hmm. uh, because, again, it wasn't nothing was online. Everything was, yeah. you know, in a book. Sure. So I found a uh, font that's called Baby's Teeth, <laughs> and I thought that would look cool. And I, I spelled out uh, pork pie with uh, with baby's teeth. And I said, you know, that, oh, it just looks dumb. It looks it, it, it doesn't fit. So then I took my little pig guy and I put him where the O was. And that's how the logo was created. Man, that's so cool to hear that. But all right, so rewind a little bit. Like, sure. what made you think pork pie? Oh, uh, so this video was a movie, or is a movie, from Australia, and it is called Goodbye Pork Pie. And uh, it's a quirky, fun little movie. Uh, nobody over here has ever heard about it. People in Australia know about it, but nobody over here, Australia, New Zealand, people know about it. So my friend Mark and I were sitting in my living room 
having a couple of beers and we were trying to think of a name and that movie was on it was playing we were watching that movie and uh i looked at him and i said marky what do you think about the name pork pie percussion and he goes it's fabulous but you don't have the guts to do it <laughs> i'm like okay that's the name <laughs> wow and i i quickly learned as a kid uh looking on the internet uh, i feel like it was like before google existed but like about pork pie hats you right. know because I, I would search pork pie and i'd be like uh this isn't what i want <laughs> i want the right. drums right yeah yeah well, that's cool man and then you design the logo when you're on the clock at work very smart yeah. and then you're out you're off and running so you're now a business owner i was probably doing uh everything for about five years before i decided to make it a business so it was uh that whole time was spent learning and trying and you know screwing stuff up um yeah. and figuring figuring everything out early 80s uh yes uh, from about 82 83 i got my business license in 1987 november 28th 1987 so uh you know this year is i, I believe it's if my math is correct i believe this year is 36 years wow when did it was there a day that you walked in your very like i mean that's a your your job as an illustrator was something that like parents would be proud of. You know what I mean? Like you're working oh, sure. on rockets. W was there a day that you took the step and walked in and, and left your job to do this full time? I mean, what was that like? Well, what happened was uh, so drum workshop at the time, they were uh, uh, just when I say just they were just getting started making drums. And I mean, when I say just getting started, they were they were not making drums, but they wanted to start. Mm -hmm. So um, one day uh, in uh, 1988, it would have been somewhere around, could be somewhere between Christmas and Thanksgiving, I think. Uh, yeah, it was between Christmas and Thanksgiving. I get I received a call from John Good from DW. And uh, he said, hey, we're doing our first NAMM show um, in January, which was like four weeks away, five weeks away, something like that. And uh, he said, uh, we're having problems with the finishes on our drums. So we would like you to come out and help us get these drums ready for the show. So I took my, uh, at Rocket Time, we always had two weeks off, Christmas week and then the week before uh, between Christmas and New Year's. So I spent that entire uh, vacation uh, working for Drum Workshop. And basically what I was doing was I was sanding and buffing all of the finishes that they had for, for the show. So we would, uh, uh, they re whoever did the finish, I don't know who that was. Uh, but they didn't sand and buff it. So there was like little specks of dust and little this and little that sure. and a run or, you know, whatever it was. So they had me come in and, and color sand everything and then buff it. And then it could go to the other gentleman. His name was Manny uh, to do all of the drilling and edges and everything else. So at, at that time, uh, as hard as it is to believe, Drum Workshop was... Uh, a two-man operation in the drum department. It was mm. me and Manny. So after the uh, after the show, uh, I kept on working there, uh, painting, and um, then uh, uh, I I was working at Rocketdyne between forty and sixty hours a week. And then when I got off there, then I whatever time it was, then I would go out to a drum workshop and I'd work till midnight one two in the morning and then i'd come home and do it all over again and i was doing my own stuff at the same time man so i went to john good um uh and i said basically i have i'm out of gas completely and you either bring me on full time or i have to quit and they hired me Jeez. Now it's just about this time in uh, 1988 that uh, they hired me. It was June 1988, and I worked. I worked there for one year, and then um, 
I had been become so busy with uh, pork pie that I thought, uh, yeah, so here's the thing, uh, in the timeline, I was single, I had a dog, I had rent, and my car was paid for, and I had a ton of money in the bank from uh, uh, from working at Rocketdyne. Jeez. So I... Living the dream right there. <laughs> you can yeah, do a whole yeah. lot when you're single... No car payment, paying rent, not even a mortgage and keeping up your house right. and stuff like that. But man, right. you you fully seized it. Uh, you can do things when you have kids. I'm We're doing this right now. I mean, we both you can get things done, but it's a hell of a lot easier when you're uh, oh, yeah. fancy free, you know, working 100 hours a week. Oh, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. Wow. I, I remember it was a Sunday night. <clears throat> it was a Sunday night and I called my mother and I. uh I said, hey, uh, I'm going to quit my job tomorrow. And she, uh, you know, very quiet on the other end. And she said, uh, do you think you can do it? And I said, I honestly have no idea. But if I'm going to do it, I, I have to do it now. I, you know, I, it, it just this yeah. is uh, this is the time. So funny story about that. So then I went in and quit and I gave them uh, I said, I won't leave you until you have somebody in that I can fully train and you know we can you know i'm not going to leave you hanging and so i left and i still have a, a great relationship with um with everybody at dw i mean i was on the phone on uh thursday i was on the phone with john good for over an hour mm. just catching up you know and i see i talked to don i i know chris really well you know i know all those guys yeah so um uh so i quit and then the first day uh, the first day of being self-employed, uh, my, my, the thing that I made myself do, uh, is I was not allowed to touch, um, any of my savings. I had to, I had to make it happen without, you know, eating up yeah. everything that I had in savings. So, um, my first day of being self-employed, I get a call from a guy, his name is Jim Carnelli. And he said, I just bought a um, Noble and Cooley. And he said, I heard you're the guy to do uh, edges. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I, I'd be happy to do them for you. So he brought brought the drum over to my house, took it apart, and he was sitting behind me. I was in a garage. I barely had any tools or anything. I had a little router table. And um, he was sitting behind me, and it was June in LA, so it was very hot, very sweaty. So I'm cutting the edge. And my hands were sweaty and I dropped the drum and it, so here's the router blade right here. And it fell right on the router blade and it took a chunk out of the edge. Oh, wow. And he had just, he had left, he had left a store called Valley Arts and came to my house with the drum. So he didn't even own the drum two hours and I ruined it. So I stopped and I stood there and I turned the router off and I just, he said, is there a problem? And I said, well, I just ruined your drum. <laughs> and he came over and he, he looked at it and he goes, well, what do we do? And I said, okay, well, follow me. We went up into my bedroom and I called Gary Levine, who was the manager at Valley Arts. And I said, Gary, I need some help. I just, uh, the drum that you just sold to uh, Jim Carnelli, I just ruined. I need to buy him a new one. And uh, so I drove him over to Valley Arts and I bought him a brand new Noble and Cooley oh. and gave it to him. And the funny thing about that, the really funny thing about that whole situation that I can laugh about now is that I've done edges on every drum that Jim Carnelli owns, literally every single drum, but he won't let me touch that Noble and Cooley. <laughs> It's like a, an omen. I mean, but yes. I think that's also worth noting, too, is even from the very beginning, pork pie is not really just pork pie. I mean, you've done a lot of you do a lot of work on other drums. You've painted other drums. I mean, so uh, obviously the brand pork pie, you sell pork pie drums. But you as a person have I'm, I'm sure you've worked on every brand of drums in existence. Oh, um, I, and I still do to this day. Yeah, I, I work on everything. Yeah. Uh, and we we painted. I mean, here I'm here in my office. Uh uh i've done work for uh for the cult uh pennywise faith no more guns and roses poison megadeth uh uh black sabbath uh better than ezra um mike fasano when he was with the down boys or warrant mm -hmm. um i painted for zz top van halen 
Um, I mean, you know, uh, Toto, well, that Carl kit. I mean, why don't you, while we're on that note, because like that's kind of, I heard, I remember reading somewhere that you painted like Chad Smith's kit and things like that. Like what, um, what does that entail? Like what, what, what is like that process? So they get a drum set from their sponsored from Pearl, from Yamaha, whoever, like are all those instances you just gave getting a custom unique paint job basically for the drum kit? Well, it, it either goes to, uh, it goes two different ways. So let's say the Chad Smith uh, uh, kit. We, I did two. I did. I participated in two kits with uh, Chad Smith. So one kit, the first one we did. Um, I have to keep it clean, uh, but he wanted uh, uh, he wanted certain body parts over all of the drums, <laughs> and he wanted to very Picasso looking. So okay. the the drum set was done with myself and my very 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 close friend johnny douglas who paints drums for everybody and he's i mean his his artwork is phenomenal so uh he um that's the the it was johnny and i who did worked on uh zz top stuff and uh uh the van halen stuff because he was alex's guy for 20 years you know mm. uh, a long time sure so Johnny called me up and said, I've got, I'm doing this uh, kit for Chad and I need your help. So we, he did, the, he basically did the artwork, the graphics, cause that's not my thing, but I did, I did all the prep work and the base colors and then he did his thing. And then I did the, the top coating and the sanding and buffing and, uh, you know, edges and all that stuff uh, after that. So he, from what I remember, he used that kit once or twice and it was stolen. And that's when we went, and I, I still have one of the bass drum heads here. That's when we did that really cool octopus kit. Yeah, the Red Hot Rhythm Method, I believe, tape had that in it. Uh, right. His, like, instructional tape. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Which is beautiful. Uh, so Johnny called me up and said, okay, we're doing, a, we're doing another kit for Chad because that one was stolen. So the, all of us met at my house. Um, and uh, we had, I had Chad at the house and, and Johnny D., and we were going over the design and it's like, oh, I, I want it to look like this. And, uh, and I want this and I, you know, I want it to look like the ocean. So I want the, the bottom half to be uh, like, a, a look like ocean water. So I took the um, shells and painted them white. And then I sprayed pearl over the top of that. Mm. And then I did a, a fade from the bottom up of turquoise. And then on the bass drum, I faded uh, uh, from the sides of the bass drum down to the bottom was turquoise. So it looked like it was, you know, a, it looked like a water line, basically. Yeah. And then they go to Johnny D and he does all the graphics and then they come back to me and then I do all the all the other stuff. Wow. And then so that that example, though, would go across most of those artists like that you mentioned. Yeah. Well, some guys just want to want a color. So if they come to me with a uh, with a color idea. They, they just say, oh, I want, uh, uh, you know, I have, uh, I want it blue. And I'm like, well, you know, anybody can do blue. Let's, let's make it a cool blue. And well, yeah. what are you, what are you talking about with a cool blue? And I said, well, instead of just doing blue, why don't we do a uh, multi-layer candy, oh, you know, over black pearl and, you know, over silver sparkle or, you know, whatever. And so some come, come with the tech and then some I, I do uh, on my own because they just want a standard color. Not really standard, yeah. but they want a custom color, but that's something I can do on my own. Yeah, gotcha. That makes perfect sense. So, um, all right, we were in the 90s, which are you, late 80s, early 90s, kind of on your timeline here, which as we right. mentioned in the beginning, 90s was really a kind of ex a big time for pork pie. I mean, that's kind of yes. when you came into your own and started to really, really blow up. So so what was what happened there? What was that like? So uh, what really um, was a pivotal moment was the uh, the kit that I made for uh, uh, Primus, and that kit came about from my uh, my very close friend. Uh, his name is Brain, who has uh, uh, was the drummer from Primus after uh, Herb left, and Brain has done a million different things. And um, so Brain ordered a kit from me, and he and Herb were tight because of the San Francisco thing. So Brain told uh, Herb, you should go to this guy. And that's when I made that big giant amber kit for him. Uh, and so the, the funny part about that is I was working on uh, the kit for Brain. 
I was working on Herb's kit and both of those had a deadline. And then I get a call from Alan White from Yes, who wanted a custom finish on his kit. So I was working on this uh, a big kit for Brain, a huge kit for Herb, and then a huge kit for Alan White. And they all had the same deadline. So I was working, <laughs> I mean, literally I was working around the clock uh, getting all those done. And um, so it was it was working on those at that time. And that's also about the time that I did my first NAM show. And uh, I had uh, no idea what NAM was. I had no idea how NAM worked. I knew nothing about it. So, uh, of course, I was behind schedule and getting the parts. I was behind schedule. And uh, there was uh, a period. Uh, uh, I tell the guys here at the shop all the time. There was one night that I was working. I had worked, you know, two or three days without sleep and barely any food. And so on a snare drum, you, uh, you have the throw off and butt plate. And then you have on the bottom hoop, you have corresponding holes in the uh, hoop. So you can put the snare straps through. So I put, I was putting a snare drum together and I put that snare gate on the, on the hoop. I put it in the wrong spot. Then I had to take it off and put it back on and I put it in another wrong spot. Jeez. I had to take it off and then I put it in another wrong spot and I just said, okay, I have to get some sleep. Yeah. You're moving too fast. So, you're doing, you're like, you're, you're hurting yourself by not resting and taking yeah. the time to do it. Right. Yeah. But I was young. Yeah. Who knew, you know, you know, you know, you're invincible when you're young. I mean, I just have to say on that note before, I mean, I feel like we are sitting here. My excitement for this interview is 100% because of Tim Alexander, because of Herb and brain, because of growing up mm -hmm. having Herb uh, or be, growing up having brains lessons, shredding the repas on the Narnar rad on yeah, VHS yeah. Yep. over yep. and over and just seeing him playing sure. with like, you know, he'd have something zipped all the way up and he's playing and his mom is saying, brain, your oh, dinner's yeah. ready. And I just yeah. had to go, what are those drums? And I remember he had a, uh, he had like an ambassador on his, like on his batter head on his bass drum. And I, I didn't never, I'd always seen a clear head and I was like, I didn't know you could do that. And just all this stuff and, and sure. pork pie and the lugs, it just stuck into my mind. And then of course, Tim Alexander. And, um, it just made me honestly obsessed with pork pie where I used to look on as a kid, uh, indoorstorm.com, the music store. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I would look at their yeah. pork pie kits. And it's just like you, uh, like, like another kid would look at like, you know, baseball cards or something. It would just be looking at images of pork pie kits. And, um, uh, yeah. if this somehow trickles down to brain, just knowing that the influence that, you know, something like that, that tape can have both on, uh, influence of what kind of drum set I like and and all that stuff. It was huge. So that that was a big I'm, I'm glad you said that was the big breakthrough moment. I was hoping you would. One of the other ones was uh, I had never uh, never met a, a gentleman named Mike Fasano. Um, and he called me up and he said, hey, I've got uh, I, I, I play on uh, cruise ships and I have a uh, it was an old Ludwig kit. And he said, I, uh, I want to have the edges done. So he brought it over to my house and I did the edges and he loved what, uh, you know, uh, how the drums sounded after that. So at the time, Matt Sorum was sleeping on his, uh, on his couch mm -hmm. before he got into the cult. I think he was, uh, who was he playing with? Uh, Josie Cotton is who he was playing mm -hmm. with at the time uh, before he got the cult. So he was sleeping on um, Mike's couch. And then he brought a kid over for uh, for an edge job. And then after that, then um, Faith No More, uh, the um, drum tech, his name was Feely. I get a call from him. He said, yeah, I just talked to Fasano and he said uh, that I should have your uh, have you do edges on uh, on um, uh, Feely's kit. Wow. Mike, Mike yeah, Bolton's yeah. kit. And um, so I did that, and then for years after that, when either one of those guys got a kit from Yamaha, it would come to me first and then go to them. Man, still, still today. I mean, I get stuff before the guys get it. Wow, and yeah. we cut the edges and you know make it make sure everything's cool. Uh, then the, the guys get it and it goes to rehearsal or what you know whatever they're doing. I want to note too that Mike Fasano, we we've talked on like social media and stuff. He's just he's a drum guy. Like very nice guy, yes. but in general, just very enthusiastic about drums and the history of it and all that stuff. But I mean, Faith No More, Primus, 
uh, these bands are very like that era. I mean, you were right. You you seem to be always in the right place at the right time with these with these like like seismic changes in like culture. If you know what I mean, like like the drum industry it's, changing. It's clean. It's clean living. It pays <laughs> off every time. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing that I think, and I'm not trying to make myself look better than anybody else, but um, what I charge when I do an edge job, what I charged back then is what I charge now. Oh, really? And I, and I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who the guy is. Let's say Faith No More or Guns N' Roses at the time, biggest band in the world. I'm working for them. I charge the same price for everybody across the board. I don't try to gouge anybody. I don't try to make more money. I charge for what I do and I move on. I get them what they need when they tell me that there's a deadline. I work on that deadline and I get it done. An example of that is I received a phone call years ago from uh, my uh, uh, my uh, uh, friend Joe Hibbs who passed away five years ago, I think, something like that. Um, at the time, he was working at Tama, and Joe Hibbs is an interesting, um, interesting guy. The thing that makes him interesting is when he was young in Texas, he was always uh, always played drums. But he got a job working in a drum store, and I don't remember the the name of the drum store. But he told me that when he was working at this drum store, his job was on Saturday to load into station wagons giant boxes of Ludwig drums, you know, from, mm. from Ringo, you know, that's when everybody had to play a Ludwig drum set. Yep. So his job was literally to load, you know, the, the drums into the back of station wagons. That's what he did. Then he graduated Jeez. from that and to the sales floor. And then after that, then he went to work for Promark and he worked for Promark for years as their artist relations guy. And then he went to Tama. And from Tama, he went to Premier, and from Premier, he went to Mapex. But after my first NAM show um, that we just talked about a minute ago, I received a phone call from him, and he said, uh, "He said, you know, I saw your stuff at NAM last week, whatever it was." And uh, he said, "I work at Tama, and uh, Ta there's Tama Drums and Ibanez are owned by the same company, Hoshino." Mm -hmm. So he said, "We have a." custom shop here at my office for guitars but we don't have anything that we can do to offer people for drums and he said we would like you to be the tama custom shop so he said what i'd like to do is i'd like to send a kit over to you and do your thing to it we'll get it back we'll take a look at it and so i worked for i worked i always i always like to say i worked for joe hibbs because he was the guy so I, I worked for Joe Hibbs when he was at Tama, at Premier, and at uh, Mapex. So mm -hmm. at, um, at, uh, at Tama, I, uh, I did edges for him all the time. One year, I, I covered 11 drum sets for Lars uh, from Metallica uh, that he mm -hmm. was buying from them and giving them away to people. I have no idea who they, who they went to or why they went to them. I have no idea. But cool. Hibbs would show yeah, up at my nice. house with uh, with a kit and wrap, and he would say, "Get it done for me," and I'd get it done. Um, but one of the one of the cooler things that he did while he was at Tama was he called me up one day and he said, "We have uh, Megadeth. There's I have a gold record from them for this job." Um, he said they want a acrylic drum set, and nobody was making acrylic at the time besides Zikos. So he said, "I'm going to send you all of the parts." and the band will send you all the shells and i need you to put it together so the first thing i had to do is i figured i had to figure out how do you drill acrylic because it's not wood yeah so i went to a acrylic place and i said how do you drill acrylic and he said you know you do this this you know special drill bit this you have to have a backer on it so it doesn't blow out the back you know all that stuff so i ended up making two drum sets in acrylic for Megadeth, <laughs> and uh, there was a, a an unbelievable hard deadline when everything had to be done, and I worked around the clock uh, four days straight getting this done. I mean, I never took a break, and as I was putting the heads on the last kit, a semi-truck pulled up in front of my house, and <laughs> the guy 
the the the, the truck driver was taking road cases off and wheeling them back and as i put the heads on them they were going right in the cases and back on the truck and then they went to arizona for the first show that's a long way to come since dropping the noble and cooley drum to perfectly timing up your mega death kit <laughs> right right that's so awesome. uh from that i got a uh i got a platinum record from them that i'm looking at right now and uh when I finished and that uh, uh, the, those last drums went in the cases, I ordered a big pizza and uh, watched some TV, and then I slept for a couple of days. That's how it's so funny you say that because, like, if I get like like video and if I get a big gig and I get some extra money, usually the first thing I do is like order a calzone. <laughs> it's like that's yeah. how I that's how you I celebrate. It's like yeah, you have to celebrate some pizza or a calzone. <laughs> right. I love that. All right. Well, let's kind of move forward here in the timeline. So the '90s. I mean, you're cranking through a bunch of cool stuff. What's your? I mean, you had to have some staff. Did you have people helping you at that point? You. I mean, you are. No. It's just you, just the head hog. When when I moved into this building, I had uh, I had one part time employee, and uh, so it was just me and Chuck. And uh, uh, right before I moved in here, um, and the reason I moved here uh, into this building here that I'm in now, which was 25, 24 years ago, and I know it's 24 years ago because we wanted the business out of the house when, uh, uh, for when we had kids. Yeah. So, you know, because I didn't want guys like you coming around with my children around, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de deviants, uh, deviant drum guys, yeah. So right. I want to show you this. So for the video, so this is a 2002 pork pie snare that I got. This was at mm -hmm. Guitar Center. So I know you've yeah. you've had some work and there was some series that were just with Guitar Center uh, signed on the inside. I was 12. Uh, I got this. I worked at a grocery store slash butcher. Uh, I bought mm -hmm. a Star Classic kit and a lot of it was like scraping blood off the floor, which is kind of funny with pork pie and all that meat related sure. yeah. uh, stuff. But um, and I, I earlier than that, I used to have a pork pie T-shirt in fourth grade and I would wear it to school. And I'm sure everyone would be like, what the hell is this? But I love sure. that shirt. And I, th I think I lost it. I have to get another one. But um, this drum, I used to get so many compliments on it. Uh, I, it's kind of a, I think it's a 12. I mean, it's a pretty small snare, uh -huh. yeah. um, but I used to get compliments on, on it all the time. You did transition. You you had a partnership with Guitar Center, correct? Never a partnership. I just sell to them. I'm one of their vendors. So um, uh, one of my uh, closest friends, his name is Walter Earl. Um, he knew a gentleman at uh, Guitar Center. His name was John Parker, who is no longer at Guitar Center. But um, he said, hey, uh, are you interested in selling some stuff to Guitar Center? And I said, sure. And I think at the time, Guitar Center was four stores or five stores, something like that. Hmm. And I said, I'd love to, you know, why not? Um, you know, it's another vendor, another dealer. They had uh, Sherman Oaks, Hollywood. Um, all the stores were, I think San Francisco, maybe all the stores were fairly local to LA. And um, so uh, Walter and uh, John Parker and myself, we all went out to lunch. And he said, "Yeah, we yeah, you'd love to try, um, you know, try a, a couple of a uh, couple of snare drums." So he said, "Maybe we'll do like um, two two or three snare drums per store." And at the time, I was like, "Wow, that's you know, that's eight drums, that's nine drums, that's twelve drums, you know." Yeah. And then when uh, this also shows how old it was because the order came over as a fax. Oh boy! And it came over as forty snare drums. And I thought my head was going to explode. You know, I'm like 40 snare drums. How do you do 40 <laughs> snare drums? So I got everything together. I figured out how to do it, you know, with Chuck and I, I actually, I actually have a little photograph of Chuck and I, when we finished all 40 drums, we took the drums and put them in my driveway. Cause I was working at the house. We put down some, uh, some uh, moving blankets. And we stacked those drums out uh, there and we took a picture of us behind those uh, snare drums. Hmm. And that was the first order that I did for uh, Guitar Center. Jeez. And then that relationship has just grown over the years. Um, I mean, it's a it's a fantastic relationship. It always has been. Um, they, they've always treated me 
Yeah, I mean, everybody hears all these horror stories about Guitar Center, Guitar Center this, and, you know, they don't pay their bills and they don't do this and they treat people like crap and, you know, on and on and on. That is so far away from the truth. They have always, from day one, they have always treated me like a little brother. Hmm. And still to this day, if I have a problem, I call up Glenn, Glenn Noyce. I call up Jared. I call up Jordan. I call up whoever I need to call and whatever I need at any time. They don't bust my chops over discounts. They don't do, I mean, it's completely opposite of everything that you think. And that's why I still work with them. I work with them very closely. I've done a lot of projects for them that nobody knows about Hmm. because it was stuff for drum off. It was stuff for this. It was stuff for that. It was, you know, we, we have uh, one of the original, uh, Alex Van Halen kits here in our Hollywood store, and we need octobonds. Make us octobonds. I'm okay. I got it. You know, cool. I mean, I, I do stuff for them all the time, and they do stuff for me all the time. Yeah. No, that's, I'm glad you said that because that sometimes you do hear negative things, but uh, I worked there in high school. I had a good time. Uh, it was fun to, to do. I did work in, Kentucky, because I'm on, I'm in, a, I'm in Cincinnati, so I'm right by Kentucky, and the minimum wage right. at that point was five dollars and fifty cents. So, but again, I was sure. like sixteen, so I was like, whatever. But I'm like, oh my god, how do you survive off that? Um, I mean, it's it's a it's it's a great relationship for you. So, so the drums like this one that I have that I got there in 2002, that would have come straight from your shop, been handmade by you guys, and uh, yeah, that's awesome. I always, I kind of knew that because. I, I guess as we go on, we'll get into more about because there's the little squealer kits, right? Which yeah, now those are produced uh, overseas, correct? Yes, they are. So from day one, I have these books. Oh yeah, and everything that I make and that I sign goes in the books. Oh man. And you have so all from them. drum number one. I have I have a book here that's drum number one till what we're working on now. And uh, in in wood drums, we are up to uh, almost eighty thousand. So we've made eighty thousand individual drums. And then for acrylics, th- that has another another numbering system. Um, where for acrylics, we've made about uh, almost twenty thousand. Man. It's awesome to know that my, you know, little drum that I used forever is uh, in your book. I mean, because yeah. sometimes you don't think that that's the case. I mean, you just your brain goes to that. You're some big corporation and you're cranking these out and it's just a number. And here's a drum. Here's a drum. Here's a drum. Uh, yeah. But I I knew I mean, you'd sign the inside. So it's pretty cool. Um, but so unless I'm skipping something here, what? What goes Mm -hmm. on then moving forward with getting into the little squealers and into the 2000s and and things like that? Sure. So the little squealer came about um, because uh, I I took a trip to Taiwan to the factory. I'm going to say 2004, 2005, around there. And um, for Guitar Center, we started making a... uh, 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 this was still when uh, small diameter snare drums like yours, uh, small diameter snare drums were still a thing. Mm-hmm. So they called me up and they said, okay, we want to make a little 5x12. We want a black stain and we want black hardware on it with a satin finish. I'm like, great. How many do you want? They said 400. I'm like, killer. So the day that I finished making those was, uh, I mean, literally the day that I finished making those was the day that I left for Taiwan. They sold unbelievably well. And the guys at Guitar Center said, uh, you know, if we if there's a way that we can bring this in a little bit lower cost, we can make more margin. You can make more margin. Everybody will be happy. Uh, That's what we'd like to do. So when I was over in Taiwan, I said, "Okay, I have a new project and this is what I'd like it to be. And that's how the little squealer was born. So the, the logo for that um, was uh, uh, I wanted it to look like a baby pig that was uh, like when you hit the drum, it was doing that. Yeah. Closing his eyes and kind of that's Wincing. how the, that was the incarnation yeah. of the, uh, the logo for the little squealer. Hmm. And I, I will say that uh, Ron Danette, who's been on the show twice, has always been a big uh, advocate for 
uh, things made in like Taiwan and in the in you know in the East because he says they're really good at what they do. These are not just like factories that are just churning things out. They care about the instruments. Uh, he's, oh, yeah. he's really made that apparent to me in our talks of like, yeah, this is not you don't you hear made in Taiwan or something. And sometimes people see it as a negative, but it shouldn't be seen right. as that. It should be. And to me, no. too, like for a young kid who wants to get a, a nice pork pie drum set, I can't think of anything cooler than that. They can actually afford it then. Sure. Well, one thing to give for everybody, everybody in the world, here's from Bill, keep in mind <laughs> that every metal piece that goes on any drum that is made in the, uh, that is sold in the world uh, from, from a major, Tama, Yamaha, DW, uh, me, Ron, uh, GMS, um, um, I mean, go through the list. Sure. Every metal part comes from Taiwan. Sonar, yeah. everything comes from Taiwan. There's just no way around yeah. it. DW probably has things that they make at their shop that they put on it, but the the uh, symbol stand comes from Taiwan. Yeah. So clearly they're doing something right, and they know what they're doing, and they're producing yes. high quality right. stuff. So, uh, so yes. then the little squealer when when the kits arrived and you got it everything kind of figured out with how to make them and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, huge success, right? Everything was, I mean, Guitar Center must have loved that. Yeah, they, uh, the kits have, uh, we've, we've had a good and bad runs of kits. Um, the worst, the worst one, and I do mean the worst one that we did, was not because it was a bad kit. It was because of timing. The, um, we did one that was uh, red, like a red sparkle, <laughs> and uh, red sparkle lacquer. And that kit, uh, I would say sometime in two, between two, the end of 2007 and 2008, whenever the, the crash of the economy was. Yep, sure. Let's say that the, the economy crashed on a Monday. Those kits arrived at Guitar Center on Tuesday. Jeez, bad timing. <laughs> it was horrible. People aren't buying anything. They aren't buying anything. Yep. So those kits went into the stores and it took forever to sell them because they, we were in the middle of a, you know, a horrible recession and it was just timing. Yeah. All it was, was timing. Yep. But you know, the black one that we did, we did, we did probably six, 700 of those kits with uh, guitar center. We probably did, uh, there was the first black one. We probably did probably five, 600 of them. Then we did one with satin Chrome. We probably did five or 600 of them. Then the, uh, uh, we did one that had a 24 inch bass drum, a black cherry lacquer. We probably did, uh, 500 of those, hmm. you know, and for me, those are huge numbers for, yeah. for, D for DW. That's, you know, that's a day, you know, that's a, yeah, um, that's, a, that's good, a Tuesday. That's a good point though. Cause you say that and you think to yourself, oh, but you know, maybe Pearl is doing 20,000 drum sets in a month or something right. or, or a day or whatever, but right. I mean, but again, you got to keep everything into perspective of, of you, ha you hang and you kind of play with the big boys, but you really are an independent guy. And it seems like you're cognizant of not sp spreading yourself too thin. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be I, right now where the company is be, because of COVID, you know, again, got kicked in the, you know, what, yep. but, uh, um, you know, uh, 2019, that's about the size of that. I want the company to be, I don't want it to be any bigger than that. And I'll tell you why there's companies out there, which I'm not going to talk about, but they're trying to be the next DW and they're going to go under. Yeah. You can't, you can't become D it took 50 years for DW to get to where they are right now. Sure. You don't do that in five. No, no. When you grow too fast, that's when a company goes under. When you have too many orders, that's when a company goes under. And if anybody thinks I'm wrong, look it up. That's when companies go under is when they grow too fast. You have yeah. to grow very, 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 very slow because your cash flow will never catch up to your production ever. Yeah. No, that seems like business. I don't want to say business 101 because very, very smart people have fallen into the trap of not of, of doing it incorrectly. But it's uh, it's it's a slippery slope. But uh, you just did a very nice job of kind of zooming forward a little bit and saying 2019 is a good fit for you. Obviously, that was pre-COVID. But 
Well, right. I mean, you know, in the 2000s, let's maybe no no one had a good time in 2020. 2021 was a little better, I guess. But uh, in the, you know, 2010s and let's say now 2022, how are you feeling about things? I mean, is everything going, you know, like like anything monumental that happened in the 2010s you want to talk about or uh, just kind of where things are today? Well, from 20, uh, 2010, that's kind of when everything kind of smoothed out. <clears throat> 2010 to about uh, 2017, you know, give or take. It was hard for me personally, you know, because uh, I lost in that span of time, I lost both my folks. Oh, I'm so sorry. Th that was a tough time. Um, but, uh, you know, the business has always been the business. You know, we've always done what we do. I'm not trying to be anything that I'm not. Um, I don't. I don't want it to be big. I want it to be manageable. Um, I mean, because it's hard enough already at the size. Is it at, at the size that it is? Mm -hmm. You know, there. My I, my accountant years ago told me that there's um, there's uh, um, sales landmarks. Basically, mm. the first landmark is uh, five hundred thousand in sales in a year. And then once you get past that, when you go past a million, and then you do a million five, but everything changes when you hit two million. Hmm. And I've, I've talked to many, many people who have told me the exact same thing. Everything changes when you hit $2 million in sales. And that's wow. with anything. Yeah, it's not sure. just drunk, it's with anything. Yeah. So everything has been on course. After 2000, after the recession in 2008, the business changed for everybody across the board. Sure. And then it changed again when we uh, got hit with COVID. After 2008, it was, it was harder to sell, but you just had to, you had to adapt. Yeah. So as we adapted, we were still able, able to do well. Um, and but like i said i i i really have no ambition of being something that i'm not keeping it manageable and keeping it fun you know the last two years haven't been fun haven't been fun for anybody <laughs> for anyone, so no <laughs> yeah, yeah but but you know keeping it fun uh is is a big big part of it for me because you know i want to be inspired by what i do yeah i don't want to do it i mean if i if i'm doing something just because i can invoice it i'm not into that yeah, I, I I would rather go without. But the things that that came to me in that time, there are or there are two things that happened that were uh, the next pivotal parts for me. The first thing was, and I don't remember the year. I'm going to say possibly 2015, maybe maybe even 14. Mm -hmm. The company that we all deal with over in Taiwan, the name of the company is Reliance International, who are unbelievable people. I mean, they're some of my dearest friends. So at the NAM show, um, one of the, the U S rep, his name is Mike sales. He came over, he always came over to me, you know, big hugs. How's the family, you know, very, you know, we're good friends. Sure. We got the pleasantries out of the way basically. And he said, Hey, listen, uh, we just bought, uh, Rogers from Yamaha. And we would like you to do all of the man, the U S manufacturing for Rogers. And he said, is that something that you are interested in? And I said, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. When, do, when do I start? Yeah. You know, when, when do we start? Oh, so man. basically, uh, we started with prototypes. They sent me this shell that they had, uh, that they had made that for everybody's information, we have tried to have it made over here. Nobody can figure it out. Mm. The shell is unbelievable, right? Mm. So what makes the shell? Uh, what, what is the like that you can divulge to us? What makes it uh, so special? Well, it's a, it's a three ply shell and each shell, each ply, I think is two mil, two millimeters thick, two or three. So it's a three ply shell, maple, poplar, and maple. And the thing that people can't figure out is how to, uh, uh, how to bend the maple because it's so thick because mm. maple wants to break. Yeah. So there, there are companies like Craviato or Eric soy. There are different companies that make solids all the time and they could figure out how to bend it. 
But the thing is, this is a production thing. It's not like you're making one or two or three yeah. or 20. Yeah. We receive, uh, I've got a, a shipment of Rogers stuff that's on the water right now. And I think there's like a hundred, six and a half by 14 shells on that, on that shipment. It's being able to facilitate yeah. the product consistently. So yes, exactly. So I have no idea how they, how they do it. They won't tell anybody how they do it, which I'm, I think is pretty cool. Yeah. They developed the technology to be able to do this and nobody knows how they do it. So it has the three ply shell and then it's got a two ply maple reinforcing ring and it's a ply shell. But if you hold it on your finger and you tap it, the shell sounds like it is a solid steam bent maple shell, man. That's awesome. That's I've seen, what's cool about it. Are you working on the Rogers kits as well, or are you mainly just working I'm doing on the everything for Rogers? You know, when when Reliance bought, uh, um, they, they bought Rogers from Yamaha. <laughs> Rod, uh, uh, Yamaha had it for 15 years, 20 years, something like that. And the only thing they did on it was put it on entry-level kits. They just put that script logo on entry-level kits. So when yeah. they bought it, the there was nothing there was nothing to buy except for the name. Yamaha yeah. owned the name. That's the only thing that existed. There was no tooling. There was no, you know, there was no this, there was no that. You, you, they bought a name and they retooled all of the hardware from nothing. So it started out from zero to where we are now. Hmm. So we started out that project with, um, uh, uh, with uh, prototypes. And uh, they sent me, I think they sent me five or six vintage Rogers, six and a half by 14 Dynasonics, because that's what we were copying. At that time, we mm -hmm. weren't going to get into metal drums. We're still not going to get into doing uh, promo over steel, because you can buy those for, you know, 100 bucks. They're everywhere. Um, but the six and a half by 14 Dynas is what everybody wants. They sent me the, the vintage drums, and then they sent me the shells, and they said, we want you to copy it. But we want it better. Mm. And I said, of course, we're going to make it better. I'm not going to mess around. We're going to we're going to make this cool. Yeah. So yeah. we uh, <laughs> uh, the first edge that I cut on it, uh, that drum went to Steve Jordan and he played it for like a minute and he goes, nope, that's not it. And they said, well, OK, well, what's wrong? And they, they told me what was wrong. And I said, OK, I know how to fix it. So I, I made another one. And what I did was I changed the bearing edges. So I changed the edges and I sent it over to them and he played it for a couple minutes and he said, this is perfect. It's right on the money. And then that's a snare drum go. that he took out with that year that he took out with uh, John Mayer. So he did a whole summer tour Jeez. with that snare drum. So then we that's went awesome. into production and we had normal uh, growing pains of, uh, oh, what's going on with this finish? It's not working well. It's wrinkling. It's, you know, we've got a shell problem, but we figured it out together. So now we, I mean, we do a ton of, of uh, work for Rogers. I mean, we do a lot of work for Rogers. Yesterday, Friday, um, I was on the phone with a gentleman named Ken Fredenberg, who is uh, basically, he's heading up the Rogers. Um, he's the Rogers guy over here. It's he, uh, Ken Fredenberg, who I've known forever. And then uh, a gentleman, gentleman named Jim Stanek, who, who handles all the posting on the Rogers um, uh, uh, official Facebook page. He does all the social sure. on that. Uh, so it's uh, Ken and Jim and uh, myself. And I told Ken yesterday, we were talking about the Rogers program. And I said, the coolest part about it is it's a legacy. And the even cooler part about it is we're making history. We do everything on Rogers like we do on my stuff. Everything is done by hand. We don't, we mark it on the same temp. We made our own Rogers templates on the cardboard, dividing <laughs> up pie, you know, to figure out where the lugs go. We made all of our own templates. Everything that we do is done by hand. And that's what makes uh, it cool. That's awesome. I mean, it's uh, like you said, it's history. It's bringing back one of the big American brands uh, that is just a, such a part of drum history. And um, right. I don't know. I, I think people can trust that it's I think your hands touching it. And, and just the fact that you're such a small team of people working on it, it kind of makes it like uh, it just gives confidence that it's going to be great. Um, and I, I've right. seen. 
Yeah, exactly. And I, I've seen pictures of the kits and everything, and they're just so cool. I mean, so you just, again, that's a nice way to kind of bring us up to today. Obviously, pork pie, people can find pork pie drums, and you post a lot of cool videos on social media, and you're painting and you're working on it. And we didn't even talk about the thrones. I've had a pork pie throne for so long. I mean, it is just, <laughs> right. it's like, it, it's like treating your, your butt to like, you know, you go from a normal old, just kind of cheapo throne to a pork pie. And, and it's just, uh, they're, they're also just kind of a staple of, I feel like you've, you've been, people have copied the style a little over the years. Oh, uh, a lot of people have I'm copied sure you, it. So, yeah. so the thrones came about was me, me being at a gig on a Sunday afternoon. And I remember the gig. And I was uh, sitting at the bar during a break, and I looked over, and the um, uh, 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 the bar stool next to me was was covered in uh, green sparkle vinyl. Mm. <clears throat> and I was staring at it. I, I just stared at it like this. Mm. And I'm like, that looks like a drum throne. So at the time, I had a guy uh, here in L.A. that was making the tops for me, but we were just doing black. And... Um, I called him up and I said, hey, Dennis, do you, you remember that stuff that was in dune buggies when we were kids? You know, that uh, that sparkly crap that they had in dune buggies. Mm. I said, do you have any of that stuff lying around? He goes, I've got rolls of that stuff that I can't <laughs> give away. Nobody wants it. I'm like, OK, so make me four different tops. And what colors do you have? And he says, well, I've got gold, green, silver and red or blue or whatever it was. And I said, great, what can we put on the top? And I said, let's, let's make it, you know, make it funky. Yeah. So he goes, well, I have some leopard material. Why don't we put that with the gold? I said, perfect. And then for the, um, um, for the silver, he said, I have a zebra print. Why don't we do the zebra? And I said, perfect. And pick two other ones for the other colors. I don't care what they are. And uh, I remember the day I, I uh, had those samples. And I went out to a guitar center. I scheduled a meeting and they said, okay, what do you got? And I took them out and I put them on the, on the table in front of them. They're like, we're going to sell the, you know, what out of these. And they ordered and, uh, we, we do every year we do, uh, COVID has, you know, screwed everything up, but in a good year, we'll do between four and 5,000 thrones every year. And that's been for 25 years. Wow. Yeah. And I keep saying, I, I keep saying at some point we're going to run out of asses. <laughs> Everyone will have a, I mean, I have a zebra with the silver around the side that I got at Guitar yeah. Center in, yeah. I mean, probably 2001 or something like, or yeah. 2002, 2003, maybe. Um, yeah. I mean, and I've, I've had, it's been, it's been great. I still use it all the time. It's right behind me. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's become like a, like a ubiquitous, like it's like a staple item that you just, you just see and you just take for granted sure. almost now. Um, so here, here's a story about uh, the throne. So that guy, Dennis, that I was talking about, um, he, um, <clears throat> we had this great relationship for years, 20 years. And in 2000, 15 it started getting weird 2016 it was really weird and 2017 it was not tolerable so the the guy at my shop who handles thrones for me his name is gus and uh we were just at our peak of frustration with you know what we were getting or not getting from them and uh gus and i were sitting here i was in this chair and uh Gus came to me and he said, he goes, uh, so uh, why are we not making thrones here? I said, I don't know. Hmm. Let's figure it out. So we had never had any experience with anything to do with cloth. And I, when I say no experience, I mean no experience at all. Hmm. So between Gus and I, we figured out how to, well, first off, you got to figure out where to buy the vinyl the side, the silver, like in your case, mm -hmm. there's another supplier for the top. We had to figure that out. We had to source all that stuff on our own. Then we had to figure out what kind of plywood and where do you get the plywood and, uh, in side on your throne, there's a piece of plywood on the bottom on the inside. There's T nuts. That's a screw screw into. Mm. 
where do you get T-nuts? How do you get the holes in the wood? First off, how do you make it round? Yep. Then how do you how do you get the T-nuts in? Where do you get the T-nuts? Where do you get the vinyl? How do you, we learned, we taught ourselves how to screen print the vinyl because we had never done it before. Then we had to source foam. And if you don't know, there's like 9 million different types of foam in the world. And I mean, when I say 9 million, there's probably <laughs> I, more than that. I didn't know that. Then we had to figure out, okay, how do we sew it? You know, because it has to be sewn together. Yeah. So then we, we're, we weren't interested in doing the sewing here. So then we had to go out in the world and find somebody that would sew these things for us at a decent price. And then after that, then we had to figure out how to put it to put it together. Where do you get a staple a staple gun? What staples do you use that that are made for vinyl? And so yeah. because we use some staples and they just cut the vinyl. Oh, I so see. we had to figure out the type of staples, the staple gun, uh, the compressor, the you know, so we basically figured out how to do all of this on our own. So since uh, late 2017, we've been making all the throne tops in house. Makes sense. I mean, you guys, again, if you it's it's such a part of your business that why not designate a person to do it, cut out middlemen, right. middlemen where there's problems and just do it yourself. Right. And I'm sure there there wasn't a dip in quality. If not, it probably went up in quality that was more consistent oh, the quality. I mean, as soon as we started making them, we were getting calls from uh, our dealers. They, they the, I mean, all of them said, hey, you know, whatever you got, you guys change something, whatever you change, don't change back because the quality is is, you know, 10 times better than it was before. And the quality before was killer. Yeah. And now it's amazing. I mean, I can again, I have one that's I don't even know how old I 15 plus years old uh, right. and it's perfectly fine. So to get even right. better than that is, is awesome. I'm glad I brought that up because I was like, man, I mean, that's a huge part of your business. That's like, and it's yeah, good advertising. It I mean, it just says pork pie yeah. per on, percussion on the side. And can I, can I have one more, yeah. one more bit? Yeah, please. So are you familiar with a gentleman named uh, Russ Miller? Yeah. I've never met him, but I've seen him on social media and all that stuff. Yeah. So 2012, I think around there, I uh, received a call from Joe Hibbs. He came up again mm -hmm. and uh, he said, hey, I'm going to I want you to start working with uh, with a, a guy named uh, Russ Miller and me, because sometimes I can be a real uh, a real idiot. I'm like, who the hell is Russ Miller? <laughs> and then I looked I looked him up online and I'm like, oh, Mr. Miller, how <laughs> yeah, are you? Hello, Mr. Miller. <laughs> <laughs> so he started playing. He left Yamaha and started playing Mapex drums and uh, we did a. Uh, 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 basically a, a hit w with him, everything that he owns, I've done, uh, uh, done the edges on mm. and he owns a lot of stuff. So Joe Hibbs passed away and Joe Hibbs was the, uh, the product guy, artist relations and product guy at, uh, uh, at Mapex. And that's how he, ha I, uh, that's how I was involved with Joe with, uh, with Mapex. So when he passed away, then Russ started doing all of the product design with Mapex. Mm -hmm. So all that new stuff that you see was Russ Miller and myself. Russ would come up with the uh, with the concept, and then he would say, "This is what I want," and I would figure out how to make it. Mm -hmm. Then we would make it. It would go to him at his studio, and then it would be sent over to Mapex to uh, copy. So <clears throat> when Russ was with uh, when Russ was with Yamaha, he had that product that was called the Groove Wedge. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember seeing that. When he left Yamaha, Yamaha um, decided to stop manufacturing the Groove Wedge, which Russ was a part owner of. He owned 50% of the patent. Mm. So for years, probably starting in 2015, for years, Russ, who's unbelievably busy all the time, he started to saying, Hey, one of these days we're going to make, we're going to remake the groove wedge. One of these days it's coming. Just be ready. Yeah. When I say we're going to do it, we're going <laughs> to do it. So probably I'm going to say 2018, I think he came to me and he goes, he goes, Billy, we're doing it now. We're doing, we're going to make a groove wedge. He said, but we have to figure out a way to work around the Yamaha patent. So, he goes, because, you know, we really don't want to get sued. So I don't know if you have ever seen one of my snare drums, which is a uh, 
um, seven ply shell and a seven ply shell. So it's two seven ply shells. And in the middle is a piece of copper. And I make those here. I make them on my own. So the, he told me to start working on an idea of how are we going to make this new product. So this is what I came up with. Here's the front of it that you see on the outside. This is how it's mounted mm. to the snare drum. Yep. And this is three eight ply shells with two pieces of copper in the middle. This is called the X click. And again, it's mounted by aluminum uh, mounts that uh, go into the bottom. And um, so we started, we, we started prototyping. I made Russ, first off, I made him one that had no copper. And then I made him a piece that had one piece of copper in the front. And then I made him one, uh, one, one piece of copper in the back. And then one with both pieces of copper. And then when he played it, he said the, the, the two pieces of copper is the way to go because it sounds great. Mm. And we had to figure out how to mount it. So, you know, I came up with this kind of elaborate mount and then we shaved it down to these two different, two small aluminum mounts that are with that we call mono mounts. Yeah. And they go through yep. tension rods on the snare drum. And the idea with this is you get a really good uh, side stick. And the reason that Russ came up with the groove wedge was because he was uh, he was recording a uh, record with a 12 inch snare drum. And they said, okay, well, we want a, a side stick on this. He goes, well, I can't do it on a 12. So I, they had to, they had to, you know, they had to uh, 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 re-record that part, you know, punch them in um, sure. so he could record the, the, the side stick. So that's when he came up with the idea uh, with Yamaha. Let's make this so you can put it on any size drum, get a great side stick sound. He came to me and said, okay, let's figure out uh, how, how are we going to do this? So... This was this is another product that I came up with the jigs and the fixtures and the saws and I figured out I have all kinds of things that I made here, which is what we use to make these uh, make these uh, uh, X clicks. Our first year of sales was uh, last year, full the full year. Um, we came out in uh, late. 2020 2000 2019 and 2020 was prototyping and you know figuring things out so when we were planning on this we said if we can make if we can sell 3000 of these that would be killer yeah and it would be amazing if we sold 5000 of these so our first year in business we i made these little things here I made over 10,000 of them. Oh my God. Wow. I so, mean, and again on this, we had to figure everything out how to, how to, I've never used a pad printer before. So that's how the logo, you can see the logo right there is yep. done with a pad printer. We had to figure out a pad printer. We had to figure out what finish we had to, we had to figure everything out. Man. And um, so that, that has been a, a big part of the business and working with Russ has just been amazing i mean he's yeah you know turned yeah, out to be I mean, a great friend i've seen it on social media pop up i feel like it kind of caught a, a wave too of people i've seen it a lot and and if i'm not mistaken i know uh sarah hagan uh was just yeah. involved so we're on the same network of podcasts the drum click that's part of like uh -huh. big fat snare drums network and i my show's on it her show's on it and sarah's awesome but i know she was just working with you guys um mm -hmm. Pretty cool, man. I mean, I, 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 your name, I'm looking at the social media, your name is right on there, but you kind of just like, again, you just, you forget everything that you've, you're involved in. I mean, do you want to tell people where they right. can find, so as we're getting closer to the end here, let's start to kind of tell people where they can find things now with the, that's mm -hmm. it's groove X percussion, correct? Would be the, the kind of brand that that is under. Yeah. It's a uh, groove X.com. Okay. Groove X.com. Well, Bill, this has just been awesome. Um, I've had a blast talking with you. I'm going to let everyone know that Bill is going to give even more of his time, which he's been very generous. We're going to do the Patreon bonus episode, and we're going to talk about Bill's martial arts karate background, which he's got some amazing stories and just 
Uh, he's the real deal. I mean, if uh, you don't want to come across Bill in a dark alley on a bad night because uh, <laughs> he knows what he's doing. So um, but really, there's some cool information um, that that he will share with us. So if you want to hear that, go to drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a Patreon link. And for a couple bucks a month, you get those bonus episodes with tons of really cool uh, people who've been on the show and you hear all kinds of great stuff. So um, anyway, on that note, Bill, thank you for sharing all all of this, your time uh everything this has just been amazing to finally get to meet you and uh and you know hopefully maybe down the road when there's more cool stuff you're doing we can have you back on but uh for now thank you for being here absolutely it was a lot of fun and i uh i appreciate you asking me